Hey, what's up? I'm Mike Squires. This is the Couchers Podcast. Episode 93. We're coming right up on a hundred. A hundo. Un ciento. Un mil. Did I get that right? No, uh, that's a thousand. Anyway, you get the idea. A lot. It's great. Uh, my guest on this episode is another AR guy. Uh, from Yamaha, this time, Scott Marceau. Scott uh, and I have known each other for a few years now, a handful of years. And I feel like just in the last three years have started to get to know each other. And you know what? Bless this guy for his patience. Because <laughs> sometimes I just like to call him. That's right. I'll just call him. I won't necessarily want to talk about anything in particular. I just know he'll pick up the phone. And and he's a pretty funny guy. So, uh, it was interesting to hear how he came to, uh, to have this job. We talk about a lot of stuff like, like this podcast is ought to do. Uh... And, you know, the thing is, this week I would have been seeing him at Summer Nam. I think. I think he would go to Summer Nam. Um, and I, I definitely wanted to be there this year. I've never been to Summer Nam, and I really love Nashville. So uh, I'm missing him, as I'm missing a lot of folks. You guys uh, are going to enjoy <laughs> You're gonna enjoy the video episode that I made to celebrate Nam this year, I think. Maybe not. What the fuck do I know? Uh, uh, let's see. Hey, if you're enjoying the Couchers podcast, uh, I'm glad. I'm super duper duper happy because I am. I love doing it. Now, um, if you want to be of tremendous assistance in helping propel this along, leave a five star uh, rating and and a positive review on whatever platform you're using. And uh, if you really, really, really Love me and the podcast. You can become a monthly pledge donor to support the podcast. Now you just go on over there to anchor.fm slash couch dash riffs or just go to anchor.fm search for couch riffs and there will be a little ding dong that you click on there and you can support the podcast for as little as 99 cents a month. Uh, And that's great. 99 cents goes a long way, I promise you. Now, I'm going to thank some folks who are supporters now, who uh, some of them have been with me from the beginning, some have come along, some have come and gone. I appreciate all of it. So uh, check it out. Thank you, Ryan Waters. Thank you, Hayden Smith. Thank you, Jamie McParland. Thank you, Teresa Morgan. Thank you, Matt Gabs. Thank you, Justin Jones. Thank you, Deja Colantuono. Thank you, Adam Pranica. Thank you, Dan Hurst. Thank you, uh, Joan McKagan Baker. Thank you, Dan Leary. Thank you, Kathy Giardano. Thank you, Mike Lacerda. Thank you, Rebecca Pellman. Thank you, Daniel Bland. Thank you, Chris Smith. Thank you, Perry Morgan. Thank you, Oliver Spencer. Thank you, Paul Hutzler. Thank you, Justice Gash. Thank you, Dorola Amplifiers uh, up there in Washington. And thank you to River City Guitars. River City Guitars is a hot little number in Spokane, Washington. They sell uh, vintage used and cool musical equipment. Mostly guitars, basses, and amps. Um, but some other stuff. They are constantly getting in new stuff. Uh, which I would like to mention. They would love to buy your stuff. If you have uh, some cool vintage or used pieces that you want to unload, get a hold of my guy, Bobby Kloss, you know? Uh, he'll probably uh, make you feel real, real good. You know what? He'll make you feel real, real good. Uh, you can get a hold of these guys at 509-818-7693 or sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com now like i said bobby is always hustling and buying uh instruments all over the country he puts in a lot of miles this guy and uh as far you know this is the uh this is the little store that could 
Now, make sure you follow them on social media because uh, they really like simply can't keep up with posting all of the new stuff on to the website. So their website's great, but uh, that and Reverb will not be the most updated thing. So if you see something of theirs come up on social media, give them a call. Maybe you grab it before it goes up, you know? Oh, I'm going to sneeze. I punched out to sneeze. You're welcome. Um, hey, listen, every week I pick uh, a pick of the week there. And, uh, you know, this week is an inspiration piece. I like to call that an inspiration piece. Now, what this is, is a uh, 1920s Gretsch uh, Made in America tenor guitar. This is a, a high-strung four-string guitar, not a ukulele or ukulele, um, but a tenor guitar. Now, you might be asking yourself, why would Squires pick such a weird instrument? Well, I'll tell you why. Sometimes, let's say you, uh, let's say you've been sitting around this year and you, and you've ha- had all this free time, uh, but you haven't been able to break through your writer's block. Well, guess what? Put a different instrument in your hand. This is a perfect example. It's something that's familiar, but also not familiar, and uh, and it's cute. You just play it right there on the couch. Get it? Anyway, I love it. Check it out. RiverCityGuitars.com Go give them a look Sell them your stuff Buy their stuff online And uh, generally I'd also like to add Don't forget the golden rule You know Treat people like you want to be treated And If you've got it in you Just don't be a dick It's not that hard Oh yeah here we are. I can hear you. I can hear you. It's magic every time. It's, I'm hearing a little bit of a like a doubling thing. It's cool. I'm digging it. I'm just making sure that's normal. No, I don't hear it. Okay. So that doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, let's see. What about now? Um, I'm still hearing that that little double, but it's okay. Still hear I, the I, double. I, I'm just worried about. Uh, uh, it, the recording will be fine if you can tolerate the doubling, then we'll be good. Oh yeah, no problem. I can. Yeah, you're a professional. You'll rise above. That's what I do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> How's it going, man? It's going good. I don't know if anyone's listening by now. I would have tuned myself off. Already. No, you know, at, at the two and a half hour mark, I'll give away a patch. Oh, okay. That's the carrot that I dangle. <laughs> okay. I great. mean, uh, yeah. Well, uh, what's going on, man? How was your weekend? It's Sunday night. Well, it's Sunday afternoon for you. Yeah, Sunday. I live in um, I live in Highland Park, in the Highland Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, which is kind of um, situated between Pasadena on one side and Eagle Rock on the other. Yeah. Um, it's really, really nice. I moved here right before the whole, uh, pandemic happened. Uh, I moved to a new place. So it's actually been, it's just been a great experience actually for me to, even though it's weird. Um, but, uh, I'm good. It's just really hot. We're having a heat wave day. So maybe it's about 97, 98 out. Ooh, really? Yeah. It was that hot here. I mean, it was like 91 and 65% humidity. So that's a drag. But it it's cooled off now, which I'm happy about. I don't like the heat. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not a fan. I mean, I, I, um, I mean, I, my original thing was how much I hated winter uh, growing up in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and then, so I moved, you know, now I'm out on the West Coast. I moved to Arizona for college and stuff. So. I've just kind of, I went the other way. I went the, the the total opposite way. Now I just like getting blasted by heat, I guess. You went to Arizona so, State. Mm-hmm. Did you have a blonde, did you have a blonde, a blonde girlfriend? Well, that's a good question. Um, not during college. No. No. There are a lot of blonde <laughs> yeah. girls there at ASU. 
Yeah, ASU was wild. That's a was, that's uh, a place. Yeah, it was a horrible life decision. Uh, I should have never gotten to Arizona State, but <laughs> I mean, it was a really bad move. So I mean, um, there's worse. Moves, I think college right? is a good move for some people. Yeah. Um, did you finish but, college? Uh, I did. I graduated with oh, honors too. Really? Yeah, but I should make note that it was like low, low honors, and eventually now they changed. Arizona State made their GPA criteria for it like way tougher so i wouldn't have been graduating with honors in 2020 but in 2004 when i graduated i graduated hey that's on that was kind of cool that's on them you know you uh, at the time like um, you would have worked harder if if the standards were higher (laughs) right (laughs) i thought well i just didn't i just wasn't ready to be probably 2,000 miles from home and um it was just, you know, yeah. it was just, I don't know how interesting this is. No one even knows who I am when I went to, all I'll say is I probably should have just gone to a are. smaller liberal arts Scott college and that probably would have been better for me. What did you, st- did you study one of those things like uh, philosophy? No, I did. Uh, I did what's called interdisciplinary studies, which was, I did a bunch of minors and that made up my major because what does that I'm even always mean? a path. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm definitely a path of least resistance guy. So um, at the time, Arizona State was like, well, if you do interdisciplinary studies, you don't have to take two years of a language. I didn't really want to be in language classes for um, four semesters. Right. So I just did I just did some minors. So I did just my main two were justice studies or no sociology and women's studies uh-huh. and then a minor in uh, justice studies. And then and then. Uh, you know, one of my first jobs in this industry was they gave me college credit to intern at my friend's recording studio, uh, Flying Blanket Studios in Mesa, which is still there. Really? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, did you kind of did you record any bands there or were you the coffee guy? I was definitely coffee guy, but um, uh, I don't know if there's a there, probably the biggest artist that I got to be around was there's an artist named Joel plaskett from halifax nova scotia uh-huh. and joel was in this canadian band that was on a major label back in the day called thrush hermit uh-huh. and they're kind of like a, a big indie band up in canada anyway the band dissolves and the singer of the band um you know has this really great strong solo career in canada and my friend in arizona was a gigantic fan of his and said if you would record with me in arizona it's free you just have to get here um wow so yeah so while i was there uh he came down from Canada and my friend, you know, recorded everything, a two inch tape. And, uh, it was great. So it was, uh, it was the first time I ever got to watch an artist kind of do their thing and create music and studio. And it was really, it was a, it, that, so that was a great experience. Did you so, learn to like make your way around the studio? Did you spend enough time interning there to learn how to use no, the No, no. I guess I would say, I think my whole thing is, I think my whole thing is, I just like the fun parts of things. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> so like I knew I was never going to get really good at putting the two inch tape on the reels. And I, I knew I had a good ear and people liked me. Like, so those two things basically came in, in handy. Right. So that was like, that was my first time hanging around artists in that environment and uh, seeing it and it was just kind of cool, but no, I didn't get great. I mean, I got okay at like punching in and punching out on the tape machine and stuff, but no, I didn't really you learn. Like work in the patch bay. Were you out like miking up amps and drums, setting up mics and that kind of thing? No, the guy, Bob Hogue, his name is Bob Hogue and it's flying blanket. Um, his name is studio again in, in Mesa, Arizona. And it's a, it's an amazing facility. And um, he has the board for anyone that's, a fan of kind of like the dinosaur junior Boston music scene from the nineties. He has the, um, the console that was at Fort Apache. So some people know that and love it. Uh, so I think some Duran Duran stuff was mixed on it and some Radiohead stuff. And, um, so it's like this kind of cool, famous board that's in Mesa, Arizona and sounds amazing. Oh, it's a, what's the board? It's a Neve. It's a Neve board. So there you go. That's pretty fancy. Yeah, it was cool. So I guess what I learned, well, I, 
another weird job I had in college was I learned how to set guitars up. Um, I learned how to kind of be a guitar tech. So the studio that I, that I interned at had a lot of cool guitars and basses. And so I, I spent a lot of time, you know, setting up guitars and restringing guitars and making sure pl- things played as, as good as they could. Did you keep up on those skills? Yeah, enough because, because those skills got me my first job in this industry at Fender. Um, huh. at, um, yeah. So Fender guitars, oh, well, they're in Arizona, aren't they? yeah, at the time, I think they still are in theory, but when I was, so this is probably like, you know, 2000, six or seven, 2007 or so. Like, um, I was done with college. I was a few years out of college, but I had this liberal arts degree that mm-hmm. I don't know. I just didn't want to, I didn't want a normal job, but I didn't know, have any connection to the arts. So I did some weird temp work stuff and still helped out at my friend's studio and just wasn't sure what was going to happen. And then I was, um, I was playing with this band called the breakup society, which That's a good they were name. on get hip and we, yeah, the breakup society. Yeah, it was great. It was like, a we did South by Southwest a few times, but anyway, the, um, one day after rehearsals, um, the bass player I found out worked at Fender and I was like freaking out because at the time I was, you know, I was, I was doing temp work and I just didn't have any stability. Yeah. I didn't really know what, what to do. So he just told me when, you know, he worked at Fender and then that night, so I was 25 that night I went on fender.com and looked at their jobs and they had a consumer relations specialist. So which was basically customer service. Phone and service. so I applied. Phone work, right? Yeah. Phone work. Yeah. Phone. 100% phone. So Oof. I applied on a Sunday. On Monday, I had my interview with, um, I want to say his name, Bob Willix, because really? he played a big part in me, you know, even getting in this career. He gave me a chance. But I, um, I interviewed with him on a Monday, and by Thursday, I was hired. And then two weeks later, I started at Fender That's just doing crazy. customer service. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's a not a super fun job. It's a relatively <laughs> thankless job. Well, I mean, at least you're not like um, people. People I are pretty rude it. on the phone sometimes. Yeah, that, that was horrible. That part was horrible. I it's um it, something I think about is how it, you know I've been in this business like the musical instrument manufacturing side of things for I guess since 2007 and. It's just, um, I don't even know what my point was going to be. Oh, oh, that's what my point was going to be. My point is I've been in the industry like 13 years or whatever. Anyway, the, I feel like the higher, the better I get or the higher up I get, the easier it is to me. But right. like that, but those first three years, those first three and a half years at Fender, I mean, almost broke me. That was like, you know, it was like a hundred calls a day. So it was like 12,000 something calls a year. <laughs> and, but like, no one is calling Fender to say like, good job. Like, you know, it's, uh, yeah, no one's calling to say, thank you. You're great. Oh my God. Or people that like, you know, Fender wasn't just Fender. Fender owned, you know, 10 different brands. And for the whole United States at the time, there was only, I think four of us on the phones really? or something like that. Yeah. There was like no one working there. There was two guys doing emails, four guys doing phones. And I'm, you know, I am a pretty nice person. And I want to help. But, um, man, you'd get some, like, like someone in, in Nebraska who had just bought a brand new twin reverb. And, you know, the warranty on tubes is like 90 days. So, like, at day, like, 120, all the power tubes blow and take out something on the board. And it needs to go to a service center. And, you know, right. those people aren't very happy. No. And it was a lot, it was that every day. Right. Uh, it was insane. So what I did learn is I learned about like the industry and how, like, I, I just, my thing was, I guess I, I just always loved this industry and artists and I just wanted to be part of it. So I was really, uh, ambitious and I'd, I'd ask the marketing people at Fender if they'd like mentor me or if I could go out to lunch with them just to pick their brains and stuff like that. So, um, the good thing is I learned a lot about the industry and, um, you know, it was kind of like, and Fender, I mean, Fender is Fender for a reason. I mean, the, the marketing people I, I knew there, 
um, the people that help me, the artist relations people, it's really, really, it's, it's the pros. So I learn um, a lot of, a lot of great things that I, that I carried with me um, right. my whole career. So. Can I tell you a quick story? But, yeah. You for Yeah. You first. Me first. You just told me a story. Well, I have a story too. Oh, I just, you do? I was just, well, let me go first just because I have a bad memory. I was just going to say, this is my, my, that was punishment for all the prank phone calls I did as a kid. <laughs> I did so many. I used to call, I used to call hooked on phonics all the time. I used to call Jenny Craig all the time. I was just a little monster as a child with the phone. So well, that was that, like I felt free like free caller ID. Yeah. This was just, yeah lawless me and my friends sleepers calling i mean all the time so anyway how i feel is just that this was my my this is the chickens coming home to roost for me that job but right I, but please i want to hear your story uh you know a number of times in frustration over the years i've been like i'm done with music and then i move somewhere and then I get restless. I get a straight gig and I get restless. And then I'm like, all right, I got to get figure out how to jump back into this 120% again. And so <laughs> one of these times I had moved to Portland, Oregon and um, I'm trying to think, did I have a temporary gig? I ran into a friend of mine um, at a guitar store at a bar or somewhere. And he was like, Oh yeah, I got a I got a job. I can get you hired there if you want. It's great. Um, it's at CD Baby. Do you know what CD Baby is? Right. I I have a friend that works there now. Oh yeah. Well, I worked there in like 2005, and okay. um, and I worked in the call center, and man, you know. <laughs> If you think someone is mad because their tubes blew up on day yeah. 119 or whatever on a 90 day warranty, you can't imagine how someone who, you know, whatever, someone who has gotten their music up onto iTunes and through because you're their their aggregate, their aggregator or whatever the shit it's called. And uh, and they they look at you like you're their record label. And so they call up and they just start yelling at you because they haven't sold any downloads that right. <laughs> people would be so upset. And, um, man, I was terrible at getting yelled at. I was terrible at that job. Like, yeah, that's a different, yeah. You, in that job, you're kind of the gateway. They think you're like, yeah, they're keeping you're keeping them from the people hearing their music. Yeah, you're holding up their success, right? And you're kind Oof. of just like, "Hey, look, man, I just built the stage for you. You 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 got to get up there and sing. You got to get up there and yell and tell people about it." But 9 out of 10 people, they didn't want to hear about that. They wanted to they wanted to basically, you know, say that you were a crook. And I had to, you know, I can't believe I didn't get fired from that job. Well, I mean, it's hard to keep people in those jobs. Right. But the so truth I think... is, I was really good at email, though. And so, because, you know, it's a lot easier to just imagine that someone's tone is really, even if they say really shitty things, it's easier mm -hmm. to imagine that their tone is, like, pleasant or read it in some sort of a pleasant accent, like an Australian accent or something to yourself where they're just like, go, go fuck yourself. You crook, you know? And, and, and I would just, you know, I would imagine that I would read it and I'd be like, Oh, I'm sorry. You feel that way. Um, you know, can I help you? Let me, let's figure this out together. And, um, but on the phone, it, I was terrible. Did you have people that like, were lonely in calling you. I had a lot of that. Uh, sometimes. And I talked to a few, um, I talked to a few people, you know, who I met through that, uh, through CD baby was Jose Farrow, who was the old ESP guy. He had a, band. Oh, sure. And then, um, I talked to the singer from kicks 
And um, I actually sent Henry Ro- Henry Rollins got flagged for an order like his he was traveling, uh, doing like reading stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think this is off. I, I I think this is okay to talk about. He had ordered some like weird heavy like weird heavy metal record from some like someone in Michigan, some sort of like semi classic but really like off brand band basically the like the anvil of america and sure right and uh but you know we would get these things where it's like if if uh, what what is that called like when your computer i think he was traveling like he was in indonesia doing his book tour and so his order wouldn't go through cuz it, it was flagged for fraud so, you know, we would follow up on these and I emailed him and I was like, uh, are you Henry Rollins, Henry Rollins? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to send you your order for free. Um, oh, but, wow. but you're going to have to endure me like emailing you for six months. <laughs> Poor bastard. <laughs> I had this fantasy for a while that. Um, when Loaded went down to LA to play, we were going to get him to get up on stage with us and like sing a Black Flag song, but never happened. That would have been amazing. I certainly think so. Holy cow! Did, but, did it, do you know if he got asked? Did that? Did the actual ask happen, or it was? Um... Uh, no, you know, I, I, I actually might have asked him. Um. Because we were going down and playing every once in a while, you know. And he and Duff are friendly, you know. Wow. But That would have been huge. Yeah, I mean, that would have been like fantasy camp, right? What's Henry Rollins like when, like, I've never met him. I never met him. Oh, you never met Oh, okay, I thought he was at shows. I thought he was at shows. No, no, he just, I mean, no, I was, I wanted to get him to come to a show. Oh, I've heard he's wow. okay. quite pleasant. I think he's not the brooding, serious young man that he once was. I've only heard I've only heard really nice things. Yeah. So. Uh, I uh, went and saw. I mean, I've read a couple of his books. I have that "Get in the Van" book. I went and same, saw him do the same, speaking yeah. thing. Uh, one time, same. it was great. Yeah, I have a lot of. Um, yeah, I have a lot of adoration for him. I think he's. Um, I'm really, I'm really moved by artists that just keep going. That just, yeah, he really carved his own way. Like, then, I mean, who'd have thought? Like, oh, you're a singer in a hardcore band, and then you start writing short story and poetry books, and then you start traveling around and just talking. You know, yeah, and, and that's and, and, and that's and his hundreds career. of nights a year. Yeah, uh, I mean. I don't remember what the hipster magazine was in 1991 or two that, you know, like spin. It was not spin, but it was like some other, you know, like it probably had like a letter. It was like, you know, G magazine or something. And he was a, you know, he was the man of the year. And he early on when Apple was making their big comeback, he was in their commercials. It was, and all that stuff was like a big part of his comeback. It's pretty incredible. That is pretty incredible. It's yeah. A, that's inspiring. It's, it's certainly, it's still super inspiring to me because while I love to have a job, it's great to have a, a steady income. I would certainly much rather elevate everything else that I do, whatever creative things and social media things and podcast things i would much rather work hard every day on that stuff yeah i don't some people just have this like um man some people can't they just can't not create art right and um i just love that yeah when was it when Um, was the last time you were in a band oh my goodness um well, so it kind of ties in with my career stuff in a way, because I was in a band, I was in that band, the breakup society, um, 
which right, just had, had some albums out before me. Yeah, it, I, I recommend the albums are on, um, you know, Spotify. And just to kind of Ed Masley, the the singer and, and songwriter, he's a uh, he's the head music journalist for um, the Arizona Republic and Gannett, which okay. is USA Today. So he he's just a great a writer and he's great with words so his lyrics were always so amazing and he was and and through him i got connected to the stuff that you're connected to like the young fresh fellows and uh, oh. scott mccoy and got to experience that kind of world through him um because he was friends with them um but anyway i think so last time i was in a band basically i was in the breakup society and then um i couldn't i couldn't get ahead at fender like i don't know if it was me i don't know what it was but i just couldn't get I couldn't get ahead. I was stuck. I was definitely going to be stuck in, cons- you know, consumer relations forever. Right. And um, so um, one day, basically, I was looking at other companies in my industry that had jobs. And there was one at, um, there was pretty much a similar job to mine, but in Santa Barbara at Seymour Duncan Pickups. Right. So, yeah. And I just applied. It was the same thing. I applied. I was able to get a phone call like in just a few days and I got hired o- over the phone and they never met me. They just, you know, they were like, we'll move out. And they gave me some money to move. And really? Yeah. The guy, his name's Tom Menrath. I'll, another guy that I just owe so much to because he, he just hired me over the phone and never met me. And <laughs> just, yeah, so I moved to Santa Barbara. I was married at, the, or I was with my, you know, someone I was married to, and then and not married with to anymore. But uh, we moved from Phoenix to Santa Barbara, and to steal David Sedaris's words, living in Sar- Santa Barbara is like it's like a rehab clinic. It's a beautiful <laughs> existence to go from Phoenix, the you know the Sonoran Desert to Santa Barbara. Right. So that that's when I so that was maybe 2011. That's when I stopped being a band. And that being in bands and then um, I think I went back when I moved back to Phoenix a few years ago, I rejoined the band, but then now I'm back in LA again. So I don't know. I have dreams of, of playing and writing more. And Wait a minute. How long were you in Phoenix? You, you moved back to Phoenix. Yeah. So what happened was. Um, Did you live there since we've known each other? Yeah. I so you're in saying out. just in the last six months you moved. Over there no, 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 no. I moved. I moved last six months. I just moved from one spot in LA to another. I That's was in the I valley. Thought. I was in, yeah. um, and now I'm in Highland Park. Um, but yeah, I, I basically, I, I got, I was at Seymour Duncan for a few years, and then someone recommended me um, for for Yamaha, the artist relations job. And then after being at Yamaha for two years. I just almost, I, I pretty much was like, I put in my, like, um, I just didn't want to live in LA anymore. I was, but I was married and I don't know. It was just, you know, and my, my ex who's great and we're, you know, on good terms, but she wasn't really into the music scene. So, yeah. so my job of like, you know, staying out and being with bands and traveling with bands every once in a while. And I was doing lots of trips too. No, uh, it just, it. it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good fit. Yeah. So I was like, well, I'll just quit. And I'll, we'll move to Prescott, Arizona, which is where she had some family. And um, and then, yeah, two weeks before I left, or no, 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 not two weeks, two days before I moved to Arizona, Yamaha said, well, you can just, we'll just see how it is if you work remote. Right. So so I worked for two years from Prescott, Arizona. And is then that how you say it? Prescott? Prescott. Yeah, it's not Prescott. You don't Prescott. say Prescott? Prescott. No, I, yeah, Prescott. I've been fucking this up my whole life? Correct. Like everyone, but it's oh, okay. Okay. Um, See, this is an educational <laughs> podcast. Yeah, I mean, I, I ended up back in I ended up back in Phoenix for a year, and then Prescott. in 20, 2019, yeah, twenty nineteen, I moved back to LA. Yeah. Uh, um. So basically, I don't know. I write songs, and I have um, tons of ideas. I just don't. I just don't apply myself. I guess that's the problem. Man. But, you should yeah. do it. I should. Yeah, I'm a little. I'm just a little hesitant. I don't know why. I have this problem where I don't want to invest too much in anything. Like, right. uh, I don't know if it's fear of failure or I. Do, you know, 
I don't know, maybe late thirties. I'm just an introspective person. So I had those parents that were really kind, but let me quit everything the second I wanted to quit. So I'm always <laughs> like, maybe like I never got over my little, my weird childhood stuff, but right. I had parents who definitely indulged me. And anytime I tr- signed up for something and didn't want to do it, they didn't make me do it anymore. They'd be like, okay. Yeah. Like, we okay, just don't no want to hear him complain. We don't, we want him to be happy. They definitely did not want to hear me complain. That's exactly right. So, um, it's I feel like that's carrying to have me. kids. What's that? It's got to be hard to have kids, man. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I wasn't even at a young age. I knew that wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's got. I think. Uh, yeah, I think they did. Uh, I think they did their best, and I, you know. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm fine, and I'm and. Uh, you seem okay. Every, yeah, I just I have that thing where like even like even like just connecting uh so I have a line six helix, so I can use that as my recording interface into my laptop, which you know, working for Yamaha, like a perk is you know, they just give you a laptop, right? So I have this nice MacBook and I have a helix and I all I need is like one cable to connect it to and use it as my interface. And, and you like, haven't been able to buy that cable. I have the cable. No, this is the thing. I'll buy the cable and I'll just look at the cable for a few months and <laughs> then I'll plug it in. I don't know. I just, I, I have this apprehension and I, it's like, I don't want to learn the, the DAWs and I, you know, so I don't know if it's laziness or what, mm. but I always, um, I don't know what the thing is. Do you have a fear of success, Scott? Maybe I do. Well, I always, I got into artist relations cause I def or this industry Cause I always was like, well, I don't have that thing. Like I, I, I was self-aware in that. Like, I don't have, I don't think I have that charisma thing where that, like, you know, all my idols, like I was in the, I mean, Guns N' Roses was like, that slash is why I started playing guitar. Right. Um, and I was always into like hard rock and, and then it got into punk. I just, I just was like, I just don't have what it takes to do that. Like, I don't know if I can go out on the road for months at a time. I don't think I can live poor and live on people's couches. Um, I don't, th- I didn't think I could, I had what it took. So I had to figure out a straight way into what I wanted. Right. So I guess I've just, with my own art, I guess I just figured it's just not for me or, uh, you know, maybe I don't have anything to contribute. Uh, you know, it's, it's, no, it's, it's poppy yeah. cock. Poppycock. Everyone's got Maybe. something to contribute. Well, I always thought, I think I always knew I'd be a late, you know, who's someone I really looked up to growing up was art Alex Akis from Everclear. Uh-huh. Uh, because he Everclear didn't get big until he was like 37 or 38. Is that right? So, yeah. So that even as a kid, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember as a kid, like, I'd be like 18 and I'd be like, man, by, by time, or like, let's say even like 24, like tw- at 24, I was doing temp work and, you know, was doing nothing. And Bruce Springsteen was doing born to run when he was 24. Right. So I was like, some of these artists haven't figured out right away or they have that thing. Um, but I just, I just remember art being an older artist and being like, Oh, maybe you, you don't have to be, Maybe you can live past 21 or 23 and, and still be able to create art. I think so. Vernon Reed also was uh, was late to success uh, on that kind of level. I think he was in his That's interesting. I'll look that up. 30s. He was so. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I remember feeling the same way when I got to Seattle. I, I was 22, 21. And I told my, I had sat myself down. And I said to myself, if you haven't made it, whatever the fuck that means to this day, I don't know what I thought that was, but, um, by, you know, by most measurements I did make it, but just not, I just didn't get rich. Um, but everything I ever dreamt about doing, I did, you know? And I continued to do it just on a smaller level. And it, anyway, I told myself, if you haven't made it by the time you're 25, you're going to quit and you're going to go back to school. And I, I did. I turned 25 and I was like, 
man, this this sucks. I'm playing at 11.30 p.m. on Tuesday nights, and, you know, I'm like, it's not, doesn't seem to be working out for me. Maybe I'm just no good, or maybe whatever. Maybe all the things. Um, and uh, so I quit my bands. I even sold my shit for the most part. I think I kept one bass. Um, I didn't, I don't know if I had a, I had a bass and a guitar amp. I didn't have like, Oh, I, so you quit Duff's band. I didn't realize what, no, what no, no. This the, was like 1990. Oh, this is, this I'm is I'm like 25 years problems. old. Yeah. So I quit. I went to community college and, uh, I lasted, how long did I last? I don't know. Three weeks. Sure. Sounds about right. Uh, <laughs> That's all you need. Maybe three, maybe, maybe more, maybe four weeks. And then I was just like, I went to, and I was taking this thing called the coordinated studies at Seattle community college, which was this artsy thing. It was called the sensual world. And I was like, I didn't get the, the class that I wanted was not available. It was full. I don't remember what that was. It was something that was, didn't seem as like artsy fartsy, right? It mm-hmm. was whatever, something more straightforward and, and literary that I, I felt like I could wrap my head around. But, but I thought, well, fuck it. The sensual world, I'll bet there'll be some chicks in there and maybe I'll meet some chicks. Uh, and I didn't. And I right. lasted three or four weeks, and then I went to the instructor, and I was like, I really want you to just let me drop this class without penalty. And there were two teachers, because it was a it was coordinated studies between Seattle uh, Central Community College and Evergreen State College. Do you know what this is? No. It's like the most hippy-dippy liberal college in the nation. It's where you should have gone. It's It's where I should have gone. It's in Olympia, and there's no such thing as a major, or you make up your own major, I think is how it goes. And a lot of people, that's where like Sleater Kinney met, I think. They They were going to school there. A lot of people went to school there. I mean, Nirvana and, and Melvin's early shows were all there. It was like, uh, yeah, hotbed. And um, anyway, I dropped that like a bad habit. And, um, and I went headlong back in. I was just like, all right, oh, that's wow. it. Like, I know that that is a miserable existence for me. I can't go to school. That's terrible. And um, yeah, I, that was the beginning of the good part. Yeah, because then, I mean, what was like probably the biggest point of your career, you think? Well, everything is like a stepping stone, right? Yeah. So at that point, I was like, okay, I'm going to do whatever I have to do. Like, I'm not going to start bands and write songs because that seems like a that's a, a lot harder work. Um, there's a lot of heavy lifting in that. What I am good at is learning other people's songs or contributing to other people's songs. I'm not a, you know, a, I'd never written a song at that point. And so that's what I did. I joined a band. We were on Pop Llama. We put out a record. And then when oh, wow. we we put out two records on Pop Llama. And uh, when the singer, who's great, he's amazing. He's pro- one of the, probably the most talented singer I've ever, like, performed with. Um, he just, you know, he just had all these things that held him back. Like we were never going to go on tour, you know? And so Hmm. I was just like, well, I gotta, I'm just going to keep figuring out how to do it. And at what, you know, whatever cost. So I did. Then I, I ended up in Harvey Danger and then, and Loaded and Alien Crime Syndicate and so on and so forth. But yeah. That's great. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, I think you should, you should, you should at least record music. Yeah. I mean, I have to be, I mean, to be fair, like that studio flying blanket, I did record some songs there that, that I wrote was a long time ago. Uh, man. 
Yeah, like three, two or three. Well, no, no, no. This is only a few years ago. Oh. Um, when I was like that brief time, I was back in Arizona. Oh, awesome. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think I just got to, you know, this whole, honestly, I think part of this, um, part of why I think I'm doing well during this whole uh, pandemic thing is that like my existing dreams or rules on myself or opportunities I thought were out there or not out there. Basically like everything, the whole construct of that I was basing my life around isn't there anymore. You know what I mean? Like right. now I'm just very grateful to have a steady gig at Yamaha and still be able to work with artists. And, um, you know, I, I guess I'm just, but also there's no pressure. It's like, well, there is no, there's no concerts. There's no, I mean, so I can just make my own music for myself. Like, it's like the first time, you know, I just turned 38 the other day. It's like the first time I, the other day, happy uh, birthday. Oh, thanks. Thanks. I'm on July 6th. Happy birthday. So, well, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. So it feels, it actually feels like now, like I could do it and there's no expectation. So I can just do it for myself and just enjoy it. And, um, because the traditional business model just is not there. There is no model anymore. Dude. So, so I kind of think that's exciting and, and it gives me, uh, you know, hope or something <laughs> let me ask you this did you ever work with art you said that you you admired arts um uh tri- like oh his sure career. yeah yeah i loved everclear too in high school and and even that i mean their production work was all i mean if you listen to their albums there was always a lot of interesting things going on production wise and some of those songs i like that amazing. song santa monica that was a great song that's a great song. Father of mine was a big single at the time. Yeah. And, um, I know my, like, uh, yeah. So, so art, I've, I've never worked with him. I've met him. He was always very cool to me when I've met him. And, uh, so it's nice, but that's, that's one of the I, a few of my heroes I've gotten actually like work with, work with, and that's been interesting. Um, but art, no, I never really. I used to see him uh, when I lived in Portland. I think he had a recording studio um, over on Division Street, just off of Division Street. And I I worked on Division Street. And so I would drive by or ride by and he'd be out front, like having a cigarette or whatever. I never talked to him, but I, I worked oh, with I love his old that. bass player. I love that he smokes. I love when singers smoke. <laughs> That's a terrible habit, man. It's horrible. It's I mean, and, and then because you. then you see them years later and they have to tune the end. All the songs are in the, you know, half step down. But right. um, yeah, I don't know. Right. Smoking used to look so cool. I um, mean, David Bowie fucking smoked. It does see? look really cool, but now I just can't. I don't know. I just can't look at it the same way. It looks I, tough, no. right? Did you ever smoke? Uh, no, I just wasn't, um, wasn't for me. I tried it, of course. I think it's I'm like a bad, it's a, it's not a good vice. It's, it looks, nothing looks cooler and is worse for you than smoking cigarettes, maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Really nothing. <laughs> I don't know. It, but I don't know. I, you know, now that I'm like 38, I was like, now I know like, you know, I'm, I'm a totally different generation from, you know, I'm far removed from whatever would be cool right you know not a lot of young people smoke right no i don't think so it's almost shocking when you see people smoking now i always appreciate it the times i've been lucky enough to go to europe uh either for my like just you know for my own on my own or with work stuff uh i always see more cigarette smoking but people are walking there all the time you know in europe people are walking everywhere right so i always wonder if it counter I'm like, I wonder if lung cancer rates are lower in Europe. You think that maybe uh, just having that cardiovascular, even however minor that workout is on your lungs, is works against the uh, stagnant American lifestyle? Yeah, it's one of my it's one of my weird hypotheses in my head that I have no way of proving or disproving. So, have you ever heard of Google? That, of what? Google? It's like. Uh, you know, it's a massive 
How many uh, O's? G O O. Yeah, or two. G O O O. That's a million two. zeros. But um, yeah, you just like uh, it's a it's this intense network of information that you can tap into. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have like I I have looked it up. I can't. Yeah. I don't what. Yeah, I guess I could type in. Like, you know what? This could get. Feels like it could get. Maybe I'll do it this week. If, <laughs> you should and report uh, back to me. Yeah, I'm not going to do it on Sunday. On a right. Sunday, which is we're talking on a Sunday. But um, you know what would have yeah, been happening even, today? You know what would have been ending today? Huh? Summer Nam. That's right. Summer Nam. Summer Nam Nashville. would have ended today. Um, and I only know that because I looked it up. Be, um, you know, I, I wanted to, there was, I, I finished that video that we were talking about. The song and the video. Okay. It turned out pretty good. Um, and uh, I'm going to post it this week. And, and it's, as you know, it's an all industry. By the time this posts the video will also post. So it's okay for me to talk about the details. Um, it's an all industry staffed Countryfs video, which maybe to some people be like, well, who are these guys? And it's like, well, these are the fucking national fucking sales directors and a &R guys at all bunch of different fucking places that would have been at summer Nam. That's who these guys are. These guys are responsible for getting you the stuff that you love. Mm. Yeah. Well, it is. It's true. I guess my thing was you. You, um, you invited me to do that, and I. Um, we don't have, I have to this talk about thing how you weird out. I'm just. I like to be super enthusiastic and say, "Yeah, I'll do that," and then the actual doing of, because I think that got to my thing of like, "Wow, like I don't really know how to record, and I don't know if I feel comfortable playing." And but then the straw that broke the camel's back was when I saw you were doing a show with Alex. Ozier from Orange, who uh -huh. does what I do, but for Orange Amp. So I was like, oh, well, maybe I, maybe this is my way out. I can just talk. <laughs> like, in real, like in real life, I can just talk my way out of it. <laughs> well, you know what? It, it, almost, it almost did me a favor, I guess, because I, I realized that it didn't leave anything for me to do except for play the guitar solo. And so... Um, that's fine with me. It's, it's almost like, uh, it's not hard for me to imagine an evolution of cow trips where I don't even appear, where all I do is produce, you know, I just, I'm like, I, it would almost be fun to do blind date episodes where I don't tell anyone who they're playing with. And wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I just have all these like mixed, like all-star bands or whatever, like maybe, who knows? I don't know. Maybe Zach Wild is the guitar player. Maybe um, Rudy Sars on bass. No, maybe like no, because they're too closely. They've both played with Ozzy. Like oh, yeah. that would be like. I mean, you know. I mean, but what if I had Zach and Gus on an episode together? And they, but they never, neither of them knew. And they did battle, you know, like, and they did like a fucking Scorpions battling guitar solo or something like that kind of thing sounds really fun and exciting to me. And then I wouldn't even have to appear in that. I could just be like, hey, you're not going to know who you're playing with until, you know, until the video comes out. So now you, there you go. That sounds like a lot of fun to me. I like, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, it probably would do a lot better if I wasn't in the video too. <laughs> I was kind of bummed uh, this this week. I think it was this week. Um, you know, I work a lot. Um, I guess the band that I probably work with the most and, and have honestly have the most from uh, is Smashing Pumpkins. I was supposed to go. They were going to be doing the opening, uh, the East Coast States oh, with Guns yeah. and Roses. Yeah. So I was going to be... I was going to be at uh, Fenway for sure, at least for that show. So I was looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that sucks. That's a bummer. I've never seen Smashing Pumpkins, any of the lineups, any incarnation, any live performance. They're pretty amazing. They're, it's the real deal. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's powerful stuff. It's really amazing. 
They I, really, um, it's a great band. I have friends that saw them at the off ramp in Seattle, which is, do you know that venue? No, I don't. Now it's called, maybe it's called El Corazon now, or yeah, probably El Corazon. My dogs are going to start wrestling. Hey, you guys, I see that. You go to bed, go to bed. Good girl. Um, yeah, it's like a five, six hundred, maybe six hundred capacity club, and it's wide and and like shallow. So, you know, there's not there's not a place in the club where you are more than like thirty feet from the band. Oh wow! You know, and uh, I saw Iron Maiden there actually. Um, when Blaze Bay like was the- singing. Oh wow which was really weird. I left early, um, which is unheard of. But yeah, you know, my friends that saw that show, that Pumpkins show to this day, say it's the best show they've ever seen. That was like 1992 yeah. or one. And they're just, yeah, I mean, like they're still talking about it. It's been how, how many years is that? 30 years. Yeah, I mean, they're one of like, um, I think people don't, I mean, you know, there's a Diamond Award in the in the USA, there's, you know, the Diamond Awards was when he sold 10 million million albums. And uh, I mean, it's only like, it's not a ton of bands in the grand scheme of things. And, and I know Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness is on there. And that was a double album to make. Right. Um, So I mean, I think you know, I don't, I don't know if they get, maybe it's just me and I'm too close to it. Cause I know the people and I know, and I work with them through, um, you know, they work with Yamaha, so I'm too close to it, but, um, no, they're the real, it's, it's powerful stuff and they work really hard and it's, it's been really cool to see them, how they do their thing, but it's, it's, it's a lot of work and they really do put a hundred percent into it and they love it. So that, it's just so cool to see them. Uh, just to see bands that just keep going and keep going and keep going. It's, I mean, it's crazy to think cause I'm 10 years older than you. It's crazy for me to think that the bands I grew up with are fucking legacy bands now. Like the bands that I grew up with are essentially like Steppenwolf when I was in my twenties, like they are that old. That's crazy. So. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, fucking yeah. Woodstock. When I graduated high school, Woodstock had happened more recently than f- between the time that I graduated and now. Like the time, <laughs> the span of time between when I graduated and Woodstock is s- smaller than when I graduated and now. It's been. Uh, thir- I graduated thirty years ago. That's nuts. Oh wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I don't. I know. I know. I just. Uh, you know, I don't know. I. I just. I guess I've always been. In, you know, I love. I mean, my 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 biggest. In, I don't know influence. I just love Bruce Springsteen and. Uh, You're a Springsteen I mean, guy. A huge Springsteen guy. Yeah. Have you met him? Does uh, he have any of your Yamaha shit? No, no. I, you know, I work with, um, I work with artists that either know him directly or work, you know, or like one step removed. And I've heard nothing but, um, really, really great things about him. You know, I think, I think, um, I don't know if this is true for you. Like one of the, I think when people say don't meet your heroes or something, it's because I don't even think it's because there's the chance. I mean, I've never had ever, I've met you know, I've been lucky to meet a lot of my heroes and every single one of them has been, I think the thing is, it's like, you just realize they're, they're human beings. Right. And it's no, they're, you know, they may now, you know, they, some of them do have this one plus one equals three thing to them that sure. like, they just have this thing, but all of us know those people in real life that just never got famous. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I've just realized like, Oh, like, you know, some of my favorite artists just worked really hard and just, you know, it just worked out. You know, some, I always think of like music is like a key that's turning a lock of whatever time period it's in. 
You know what I mean? Like, yeah, a lot of people like, who why? are successful in music would have been successful in whatever they chose to to do. They would have excelled because that's that's what's in them, right? It's in them. Yeah. To so not only work yeah. hard and and be creative and find creative solutions, but just to find the way to excel. Yeah, just driven people. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I love helping. I love, love, love helping artists. As a job, it doesn't even feel like a job because I just get to really be of service to artists and, and kind of help their creative life. Um, and and just get a little glimpse. And and I don't know. It's, it's just it's it's uh, it's just weird, I guess, knowing that these people that, you know, you really look up to and have sold so many albums, it just, you know, they're pretty normal, like the same problems you might have, they probably have, or vice Pro- versa. Probably it just kind not. of, it just, <laughs> it just, it just looks different on scale. Or, you know, I'll say this, like every band, like a band that's playing um, a 200 seat club probably has the same general issues. Someone playing like a 2000 seat club or a 20,000, it just scale oh, sure. changes. Yeah, of course it all scales up. So that's something I didn't, realize either about artists was a very similar very similar issues or obstacles just the scale is different mm. or you think it's different no no i think i think a lot of the i mean once you scale up typically there are more people on the team working not mm-hmm. always i mean there were I tour managed a loaded tour, one tour. I, that's all I lasted. I was like, nope, not for me. Not interested in saving money that much. Um, right. It's hard. That was, it's hard. It took its toll on me and I was a dick. Um, but let me ask you this. You, okay. I'm trying to think of the sequence of when you came to Yamaha, but was Tom the previous guy to you directly? Yeah. He, I didn't know Tom, uh, but he was the guy uh, that I, that I came in after. Right. Uh, you never so met was, him. You never met Tom? Nice guy. I've never met him. Nice guy. I've heard he's a nice guy. Yeah. I don't, I, I just never, I've never even crossed. I mean, maybe I met him once. I think I met him once while, or, oh, it's a helicopter. I think I met him once when I was at Seymour Duncan and, oh, yeah. and there was some industry event and he was with Yamaha, but, but August of August will be six years that I started at Yamaha. I think I'm trying to remember. I, I think I applied for that job. I remember mm. asking Tom and he was like, yeah, why not? You know, and I think he was just being nice and he wasn't trying to say, ah, you don't have what it takes to deal with you. Um, Cause n- I know now hindsight, I would be terrible at that job, man. It's um, I don't think it's for, you know, you have to really uh, when you're in the position, I feel like to be really good at artist relations, you kind of have to be somewhat egoless. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I think to re- to really help the artist, you kind of have to go out of your way, and you kind of have to make sure they're number one, and um, your needs aren't as in- your needs not as in me as the company, but certainly I'll put myself in. You know, I'll make my like. I don't even know how to. Your position to say what is I'm to saying. support artists, right? Yeah, you're you're basically you are definitely a helper. You're not. It's not for you. It's it's to help the artist and the company. I can't um, believe, you know, I've probably called you a hundred times and mm-hmm. sometimes I don't even know why I'm calling. I'm like driving down the road. I'm like, I'm going to call Scott. Just chew his fucking ear. See what the fuck's going on. <laughs> and no, I love it. I you love always from, answer from the phone. What's wrong with you that you always answer my call? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I just gotta. That's what I do. You know, I I think something I, I try to think of. I think with artists too. Well, um, you know, I I just have such respect for. I I always just thought, um, you know, if you really choose that that path to be an artist, that's a really, uh, it's it's a big decision, Oof. and and it's it's so 
so fraught with failure possibilities. And, um, you know, I just don't know anyone artist long, like I just try to be nice to everyone. And I don't think there's a lot of people in the music industry that are just like, Hey, I'm nice. And I just want to help and let's do some cool shit. And, uh, I don't know. So I try to stay upbeat. I try to stay positive with artists and just be supportive. Cause I, I think just having a positive person on their team is even good. Everyone that I've met at Yamaha and I've met a, a big handful of folks over the like nine years that I've had a relationship with them. Everyone has been so cool. Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think the luxury of that with is because it, um, if you're at a smaller instrument company and then like the recession hits or something goes on and, and guitars stop selling, then people start losing their jobs. And especially things like artist relations or anything that's perceived as just like, you know, like all fun or easy, uh, you know, those things are instantly taken away or, or, but with Yamaha, it's such a huge global company that makes so many different things that even if the economy has an issue and let's say guitar sales go down, well, you know, sound bars and microchips and right. uh, the wood paneling and Audis or something uh, had a great year. So don't worry. So right. I'm removed from the commerce part. I think that's another thing that I liked about my job is I really just get to focus on the artist and, you know, the marketing between the artist and Yamaha. And I don't, I don't have to worry about sales numbers coming in. I don't have to worry about certain things. I just really get to specialize in what I do. Well, the Yamaha guitar department even is like the electric guitar department is this, am I just talking out of my ass? Is it the smallest segment of even Yamaha's musical instrument uh, sector? Um, I gotta think about this. I gotta think about this. I don't, because I don't know the size I mean, guitar, brass instruments, pianos. There's pianos. Yeah. There's, um, well, you know, Yamaha is, I mean, pretty much every school you go to, all those band instruments are Yamahas a lot of the time. Um, I mean, we've got to be smaller than keys and synths, but I'm not sure. Again, like this is what makes me not a great employee. I don't know all these kind of details. I just want to know the what I need to know. <laughs> right. Keep my nose in my own business. But no, I mean, but the staff is small. The staffs are small. Uh, it's not... Um, you know, it's definitely not like Fender where, I mean, it's a whole company based around, I mean, they have different brands, but you know, Yamaha, I mean, I'm sorry, Fender's bringing home all the, the income and, and they have just tons of people. Um, our, you know, Yamaha is really conservative size wise. I think, I mean, essentially I'm the only person in North America doing artist relations. Right. Um, so, uh, I how can't many, do as much as I want to do AR or help guys? as many. How many AR people does do the big companies have? I know PRS has two. Oh, three if you include Win out there in LA. Um, I mean, I think probably at some time. I don't know Gibson. I know Fender probably has at least eight to ten. Wow. Um, yeah, and of course they, you know, they, and they have some of the best AR people there too. Um, well, they've been on uh, a know, tear in the last year and a half or two years as well. Yeah. Yeah. I really look up to, um, he might be great for your show, Mike Schultz. He's he's probably one of the, the best AR guys in my industry. Um, Alex from Orange is one of the best. Mike from Ibanez. Um, but it's Fender. They have Mike. They have uh, Matt Farrar. They have, they have some really talented AR people. So you have like a product that's, you know, iconic and then you have these great artist relations people you know and a lot of great exciting things happen so i don't know what i'm saying basically yamaha's the underdog but we're staffed like the underdog too in a way but right. well, i remember the first in, time i visited i don't know i think the office was out in the valley and it was yeah. just like a couple of offices and a shop and uh you know there was like Basically, it was Ken. Mm -hmm. Is he still around? 
Yeah, Ken hired me at Yamaha. Uh -huh. Ken DePron. Yeah. Great dude. I like Ken. He's a great dude. Yeah, and he then, is a great dude. I Another guy I owe so much to. Um, Who was the luthier guy then? He, I think he went to Schechter or he went to ESP and then he's a Fender now. Huh? I think he's a Gretsch now. He's either a Gretsch or Fender now. I know who you're talking about. Um, I can't remember his name. John Gadesi. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. And yeah, he was an amazing builder. He did some great stuff for, um, he was like high school buddies with Michael Anthony from Van Halen. So he built them. Oh, a lot man. of the Van Hay a lot of the Michael Anthony bases you saw him using, um, not the very, very early years, but like, you know, all through probably the eighties and nineties was all really? John Gadesi building a lot of stuff. And oh, um, wow. now it's Pat Campolitano, who's uh he's younger than me. He's in his young, you know, early thirties and he started after John and he's been doing he's just an amazing craftsman. And I'm so super I'm impressed with, with all of the custom stuff that he's built. Um, the two years of Nam guitars that I've seen that were his custom builds were super impressive. Um, yeah, he's, uh, we're lucky. I mean, I'm lucky to work with him. I've learned a lot and, uh, he's great with artists too. So, uh, you know, so he works anything I, you know, for pumpkins or God, I mean, any, um, you know, Butch Walker, I work with a lot. I'm lucky. Uh, you know, we'll do custom stuff for artists. And he, you know, having a guy like Pat who can talk with artists and gets in their head a little bit to, to understand what they're going for has been, it's always a great experience. Yeah. He was a, he was a great guy to hang and talk with at Nam for sure. Super. Oh, super okay. Cool. I'm glad you met. I didn't know you. Uh, I didn't. Oh, yeah. See, this is how. No, I follow him on Instagram too because, because, uh, he puts personal stuff up there, but he also puts a lot of builds. Hey guys, why don't you cut it out? Get up, go to bed. We're not here to fight. We're not fighting. We're friends. Yeah. That's how we do it around here. You I gotta, like that. You got to talk to the dogs. Come here. Come on up on my lap. That's right. I got Rosie on my lap. I'm going to roll her over on her back and rub her belly while we talk. She loves it. I had Mr. Big up here for the first 15 minutes of our talk. Mr. Big, down. that's one of your dog? Yeah, Mr. Big. He's, uh, you know, he's a man of many names. Um, when we adopted him, he was just, he was called Biggie. He's a little dog. He's about 11 or 12 pounds, you know? He's yeah. Like a, you've seen him. You've seen pictures of him. He's like a little wiener dog. Um, and, uh, you know, he's a big mouth, but, uh, but I call him Mr. Big. We also, he's, he's a compulsive licker. Like he just, if you have him on your lap, he's just like licking you. He can't sure. stop. So I call him Mr. Lickety or Lick Springfield or Jolly St. Lick or, you know, Lick Jagger All and, and whatever you fill. Lick in. Jagger. Lick Jagger. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yep. He's a man of many names, as I've stated. <laughs> Sometimes I speak to him with a Kentucky accent. Um, and, yeah, animals um, bring weird stuff out of you. It's kind of kind of strange. What animals? Yeah, like you can get creative. Like all of a sudden, like makes. I think animals make you more creative. I think they. Um, I love I to talk know. to my. I talk to my dogs all day. And, not, you know, they don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But, you know, I had an uncle who would talk and sing to... Yeah, he was like fucking Dr. Doolittle. I mean, he I, he's still my uncle. I have an uncle who talks to his animals. And uh, I think I've taken after him. He also sang Christmas carols in the summer, you know. Sure. He's a very happy guy. He's, an artist. He's the best. He's the best. He's going to move out here to New York. He and his wife, they're, you, they're fucking moving here to be to be close. It's, I'm so excited. Are they really just to be closer to you? Yeah, to be close to family. I mean, my aunt has a daughter who lives out here as well. So, yeah, I'm super pumped. He's would such you, a great dude. Would you move back to, or I don't know, did you ever live, live in L.A.? I never lived there. Twice I 
I threatened to. I came off, I got off tour once. It was one of the times when I was like, I'm fucking done with this. You know, I had like gotten my second record deal and, you know, I had a series of failed tours or, or like miserable tours or things that fell through and a bunch of like misfires and blah, blah, blah. And mm-hmm. so in my frustration, I was like, all right, I'm either going to, I think I'm going to move to LA. And I was, I was seeing a girl down there. And so I, I dropped the band off and I got in the van and I threw my bicycle in the back. I had like a road bike. And I was like, all right, I stopped in Portland on my way down to LA and I hung out for a week. And then I drove to LA and I was down there for a week and I tried to ride my bike. And this was, you know, 2002 or three, maybe. And just like, you know, mm-hmm. no bike lanes. It was just like, it was death knocking at my door. And I was just like, this is not the place for me, you know? Sometimes I wonder how my music life would have turned out differently if I would have gone to L.A. Then when I, when I moved to New York, I was either, at that time, I was either planning on moving to the suburb or like the rural parts of Eastern Washington. I was thinking about trying to buy a house out there or going to LA and, you know, maybe like giving her another go. The uh, music. Yeah. Stuff. I think, um, cause at that point Duff had started you know, doing the guns thing again. So that pumps the brakes yeah. on, on our thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, is your thing still going officially or I mean, unofficially? We're, not, or we're just... not broken up, you know. I figure someday, you know. Well, I think um, I think Slash. I mean, he still does his solo stuff, right? So um, yeah, but in between. you know, Slash's thing is like his thing is always rock, right? And so, uh, I just I can't imagine that if I was in Guns and Roses. And I've talked about this a little bit. Like, I just can't. I think that I would probably be more like Duff than Slash in my off time. And it's great. I think what Slash is doing is put together a killer band. All those guys are great. Um, yeah. And, but it's a rock band. And I feel like no matter what, I mean, Slash is Slash. And so there's that, right? No matter where Slash goes. There you go. He's, right. He's Slash. Duff is is great. He's fucking amazing. But he's not Slash, right? No, there's right. one. Slash is like, you know, he's like another type of icon. You know? Oh, so, you mean in terms of like just visibility almost? Visibility and just like opportunity. Street? All of it, right? And so... yeah. But I guess I I just imagine if I was taking a break from the biggest rock band in the world, I don't think that I would want to be in a small rock band, <laughs> you know, or even or like a medium tier rock band. It seems like, well, what am I doing? Just staying in shape here? Like, I'd rather mm. like uh, provide, you know, like present myself with some challenges and push myself to do other stuff. And I think that's what Duff is doing. You know, that's, that's what he's, he's just like keeping it interesting and doing whatever it feels natural. Like he's just a very well-rounded musician, but I imagine that someday we will play again. We played a show year, I don't know, last year, the year, I don't know, something we did a benefit, you know, Oh, cool. Up in Seattle. Hey, you guys cut it out. Hey, Mr. Big, why are you a dick, man? Hey, come here. Don't be a dick. Come here, Biggie. Hey, Biggie. That's right. Come here. He's a... He's kind of a dick, you know, Mr. Big is. He's a very handsome little guy, right? Very sure, cute. Sure, sure. He's very fun. He's like the sweetest guy to cuddle with when you get past the lickety, you know? Um... Oh, Don Lickles, I also call him. Um, Don Lickles, I like that one. It's pretty good, right? Yeah. Um, How did were, were you were you in Loaded when the Guns and Roses stuff was starting to like going to become reality again? Well, 
Duff at that point Duff started playing bass in uh the walking papers. So we had taken like maybe a year, year and a half off. Um but I you know you could kind of smell that coming. Um Sure. Yeah. And you know I talked to Duff all like every week, sometimes multiple times a week. He's a joke guy. So he calls me and tells me jokes. And um, some of them are even good. And then we just talk about life stuff, you know, because we're fucking buddies. It's weird to be buddies with someone that you grew up listening. Like, I can listen to that record and not even think about Duff being a part of it, that Appetite record. Like, yeah, it's unbelievable. Oh, oh my God. (laughs) Uh, His ears are burning. Did you just hear that? Was that him? He's calling. Holy shit. Uh, His ears are burning. So, yeah, it's weird because I can listen to that record and I don't I don't imagine him playing the music, you know. Like when I listen my uh, ACDC, I always imagine that entire band performing the music. I don't ever imagine Duff performing that music, probably because I know him. And it would yeah, really I can see that. Kind I, of ruin, yeah, I can't. ruin things. If I thought about it too much, if I thought about how I wore, you know, three copies of that cassette out in just in high school. I think you know now. I think everyone's like such on a level playing field, like where you can see, you know, like up until like 10, 15 years ago, like the behind the scenes stuff seemed impossible to imagine. Like everything was just such a mystery. Right. And when you grow up in, you know, I, most of my childhood was in Pittsburgh and it's like, you know, um, Florida and California were just places people went to vacation. Like no one actually lived in nice weather, uh, and, and working in the entertainment industry, you know, it's, it just seemed impossible. Um, so I guess like, yeah, I think if you live, I think if you grew up in LA and you had parents who like worked at Warner brothers or maybe Guns N' Roses was a different thing than if you, you know, lived in a different part of the nation um, and what that meant to you. So I think about that a lot. Um, yeah. I mean, when I saw, so my first concert was when I was 10 years old was the Guns N' Roses Metallica Faith No More tour. Oh, my, my dad took me sick. dressed in business. Yeah. Dressed in business casual. My dad t- <laughs> took me to see that Did, and uh were you so stoked oh my god dude i was 10 i mean i was in fifth i was about to go into fifth grade slash was my hero guns and roses were my heroes uh i mean and i had the you know my dad uh you know my dad was very not like you know he wore khakis to see guns and roses he was just like a business casual guy right <laughs> and uh very corporate and but he would take me to all these concerts when I was a kid. And it was, I really, uh, you know, I need to thank him more about it. But um, anyway, I'll never forget. Guns and Ro- like, it's so easy. Duff was the, was the start of the whole, the oh, whole yeah. set. And it just like, it rocked my, my 10 year old mind. I've, I've talked about this a lot, but that record was the first record of like my music. You know, there were, of course, there's like Led Zeppelin, which is, you could, I mean, that's, I guess, my music, but it's wasn't my generation, you know? But that Appetite record was the first record where I really heard the bass present on the recording and in the mix, and it was a standout instrument, you know? It was outside of like, you know, some hardcore punk songs where the bass starts at a ding 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 and then the band comes in and there's some feedback and then they blast and blast off right right it like that appetite record was one of those just one of those things where it just stood out and i was like oh wow that's that's the bass like the bass is cool before that i was just like bass dumb well, Duff was, I mean, it's like not only is bass cool, now you got this really cool guy. Right. <laughs> named Duff. Right. Playing. Yeah, right. I mean, and the other thing, like you didn't, you know, like when you grow up in like a really, like in the suburb, I grew up in the suburbs in like a really vanilla household. And 
I mean, I didn't know anyone that drank Jack Daniels from the bottle or, <laughs> or uh, no, they, or they smoked, poured scotch into smoke. a glass of uh, ice. Yeah. I mean, now I just, it was a type of like wildness that you just can't get anymore. Cause, but, um, it was something, I, Oh, I'll talk. Can I bring this up? I, yeah, some more what? guns and roses stuff. Okay. So I've been getting back in. I think it was cause I knew like this week I would have been like doing some stuff with pumpkins and just being there, not, you know, just supporting them basically. And, um, you know, I, so Yamaha like is Yamaha guitar group, which is who I technically work for. That's the marketing umbrella for Yamaha guitars and line six and Ampeg. So between pumpkins, you know, it's, it's, it's all of those brands. So, um, it just, you know, anyway, I was going to be out there. So I've been, I've been listening to a bunch of guns and roses, which I really haven't done in a long time Rad. and songs like estranged and, um, November rain. I was like, wow. I was like, the, I think guns and roses were like the closest thing to queen that anyone They're... got since queen it just ne- they never got that cred and maybe it was because of how wild and dangerous they were and how there was like a there really was an aspect of 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 electricity around them that was on edge well i probably uh, am going to get this super duper wrong and i'm okay. sure that a lot of people remember this a lot differently than i do but Appetite came out, right? And it okay. kind of yeah. blew people's minds. Not straight away. It was a it was a build, but when it blew up, it blew up, right? Right. Then they put out that EP, which was a previously released live thing plus the acoustic thing. And they were like, "No, but look, we're sensitive too. But also we're punk rockers." And then <laughs> they put out that You Could Be Mine single for the uh, Terminator movie, right? Yeah, it was in fourth grade. That's when I first discovered them. Right. And that song seems like, you know, other than the production was a little bit slicker, which was a was a, a, definitely an indicator for me. It was like, hmm. But that song definitely seemed like, you know, it wasn't a stretch from what they were doing before. But then, you know, like... They put out two records, and I don't remember that. And it kind of seemed, maybe I was out of touch, but it kind of seemed like it came out of nowhere. I don't think that they, again, I'm sure there are people who are bigger fans than I was at this point, but yeah, I don't think that they announced, yeah, we're putting out two records until it happened. But again, perhaps I'm fucking that up. Yeah, I don't know. But it kind of seemed, to me, it felt like it came out of nowhere. But then again, you only got your news from MTV back then. You know, there wasn't an internet. You didn't know what people were working on. There wasn't, your your ability to keep tabs on artists was so much different back then. Yeah. You know, the like, the world has, has moved on. Um. But, but some of those songs, yeah, but some of those songs on Use Your Illusion 1 and 2, I mean, both of the songs, both of the albums are just, I mean, they're just, there's a grandeur that, oh, yeah. that I don't think got recognized at the time, maybe. Oh, I mean, those records were huge. Maybe they didn't get the critical. No, they were huge. Do you mean like Yeah, I guess what I'm respected? saying is, and maybe it's, it's yeah, and it's, it's me like looking back later but i'm like wow like they um they were at a different i mean i just can't imagine i don't know see this is why i never even want to meet the i mean i've met slash it's like it's been amazing but like i can't i don't think i can ever be in a room with the actual guns and roses guys because i think i would just ask too many questions right um about the, the process but yeah, it's interesting to me how they went from like even a strange like if you listen to that it's like how did they put piece that together before pro tools and um dude you i mean you have to really you really had to think it out you had to map it out before like you had to orchestrate shit back then now it's just like ah oh, we'll just dice it to and fucking paste it together no big deal easy peasy yeah i think it's one of the reasons music kind of 
isn't as good now, but like oh, the medium, yeah. the record, the, the recording medium doesn't match up with like, like rock and roll bands aren't made to record maybe in the pro tools and they get every, every kick drum, like exactly on the beat and stuff. Well, I think that you don't have to do it like that. I think that you can use all these digital platforms like a tape machine. Like I, I think that live, like real band performances will always sound best. Right. For rock and roll, you know, and for a lot of you know- kinds of music. Do you know how the gun stuff was recorded? Do you know how Duff recorded? Was he like, would he just do his tracks with the, with the, I wonder how they did it. I think so. I mean, he's like, he's, I mean, but they also took a lot of time. So there's like, you know, drum comps and all, you know, all that shit. Like, can you imagine? Doing oh yeah. This is one of the record then? labels paying you to do this. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, crazy. What a weird time. But, um, um yeah, I don't know, man. It's uh, you, uh, You'd be surprised. I've been in a room with all those guys. And the first time it w- I was like, whoa, this is super weird. But then I ate dinner. I sat next to uh, Axel. We played a couple shows with Guns back. Uh, Loaded did. Opened up for Guns a couple shows. Oh, my God. Which was super fun and weird. You know, Duff got up and played with them. Um and, you know, I sat in catering at a table right next to Axel and had a conversation with him like you and me are talking. And it was great. He was a super nice guy. He was funny. He was charming. Um, and, you know, he even let me make fun of him. Holy shit. Yeah. I couldn't help myself. I can't imagine. <laughs> you can't imagine me making fun of someone? I can definitely imagine you saying <laughs> some shit to Axel Rose straight to his face. I mean, well, that no, it I wasn't like picture. rude. It wasn't like rude in any way. I would never like, you know, no way. Uh, but I guess um, to circle back around and, and to speak on what you were saying about how maybe they were not as respected as like their music wasn't taken at face value because and why is that? I think because it was there was such a circus around the touring band at that time, right? It just was like it was pretty out of hand. There was a lot. Um, of, there were the fucking riots. They were going on late. They were fucked up. I mean, it, they were they were a, a a messy, a sloppy mess. Yeah, yeah. I never did. They play a whole show when you saw them when you were ten. Oh yeah. Yeah. They oh, played, right. um, now I looked at the set list now going back. I don't, I mean, my 10 year old mind was transformed, but at the set list, that was, I think a weird era. That was the tour where like the touring cycle where they had the, they had, a, they had two piano players. They had dizzy, but then they had another guy that had like a horn player. They had, they had you know, a horn section singers. and the sing and the backups. You know who that horn player is? Who? That's Duff's brother. Oh, I had no idea. Wow. I, just, I just actually hit him up to be in a Couchers video. So we'll see what he comes back with. I got a very special episode coming up. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. I um but I think that era of the band though, like it was rocking. Like, you know, if you look I looked at the set list from the show and it wasn't it wasn't a lot of appetite songs. It was a lot of I yeah. think they did Civil War. They did Knocking on Heaven's Door. It wasn't a lot of up-tempo right. stuff. I yeah, mean, that's crazy. My neighbors. Like a lot of mid-tempo stuff. Yeah, and then um, I'm trying to think. Um, this was Metallica, like... Oh, Black I Album. I don't know. I just, I, I, Black Album, Metallica. Summer of Wherever I May Roam, Metallica. Like, it was, you know, like... Lars with the 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 white Tama kit with the double yeah. kick. I mean, they were on fire. The I can't. I'm so lucky I got to see it. But it just it's uh, there's something about seeing like your favorite artists like while they're on fire. That's oh, yeah, something else. Dude. You know, we did a. Well, I'm a huge Metallica fan, and the yeah. funny thing is, is like for whatever reason, like I st- I started to go down the punk rock 
rabbit hole around that time. And so I fell off with both of these bands. I bought all those three records and I was like, ah, it's not edgy like it used to be. And then the Metallica was like, ah, it's like, it's not thrash anymore. But looking you mean back, the Black Album? Yeah. Looking back, okay. the Black Album, I mean, I just... Uh, I just bought it on vinyl six months ago because I was like, I need to get that album on vinyl. It's so good. And it's, it's the best sounding Metallica record. It's just fucking yeah, incredible. But do you think like, I always think like maybe part of the reason, I mean, I deal with artists for a living, right? And I do deal with a lot of my artists that I deal with are, you know, into their careers you know what i mean yeah um they've established themselves they're legacy um, artists a lot of them not all of them I'm, I'm um i'm getting to you know yamaha we did south by southwest last year yeah we did two nights of showcases and i got hooked up with artists like steady holiday and drab majesty and some really laura carbone some really younger and kind Dude, of on the hey, wait a minute. Of things. stop 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 yeah for just for a second uh, yeah, I only like I, I have this other podcast and it's a record review podcast. And OK, uh, and I had never heard. And so all the records that we review are records mm-hmm. that are submitted to us through a survey we put out. And mm-hmm. and it's, you know, the survey asks people what are, what's their favorite records from each of the last six decades. And someone's favorite record from the, from the teens, 2000 teens was that drab majesty record. I had never even yeah. heard of them and it's really great. Yeah. We, you know how I got introduced to them through Billy Corgan directly. He was really? working with some, uh, they opened up some shows for him. He was a huge fan. And then I kind of discovered him through, uh, like Billy literally introduced me to the the guys, and they're great. They're they're amazing. Andrew Quinko, uh, the he's just a, he's just a, he he is a true artist. He does not. I just love the guy. Yeah. Um, I don't think he could do anything else but create really interesting, both visually and musical musically stimulating stuff. He's just he's the real deal. So yeah, I guess I get to work with cool bands like that now too. It doesn't surprise um, me that Billy Corgan is a fan of that band because that band reminds me of what I imagine Depeche Mode maybe would sound like if they started in the last five years. And I think he's a he's a Depeche Mode fan, right? I don't know. We never talked about him, but I mean, uh, but he's definitely into bands that you know, the art is, it encompasses who they are, you know, it's, right. it, it carries on to every level, the, the visuals and the, the themes. And it's, it's very, it's a bigger, it's a big thing. Yeah. I don't really remember what my point though, what anything was. Oh, you're talking about South by Southwest and uh, meeting yeah. bands and you've mentioned Drab Majesty with a, uh, mm, along with yeah, some I other don't... bands that you were being introduced to at South by Southwest. Oh, 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 okay. This is what I was going to say. So, so I do, so I just wonder if there's less like really screwed up people choosing art as a career. Like, um, I don't know how to say this, but I felt like maybe like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, like you did, you maybe joined a band because you kind of had to, or, you know, it seemed like you could make a living off it maybe a little bit easier, maybe. But now, like, you know, everyone has to become their own PR company now. Right. And um, it's a brand. And, like, I really love meeting <laughs> artists still to this There's day. one thing like, I hate is the term what? personal brand. Like, I'm I hate that fucking, shit, too. Yeah. Oh, it drives me crazy. Someone's like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't know if that really aligns with your brand. Like, what the fuck do you know about my my brand? I'm not branded. Yeah, anyway, it's, um, sorry, I'm not into it. But but when I hear people, when I when I meet younger artists, and none of the ones I just did have done that. But when I meet younger artists, and they kind of see they use terms like trajectory right. and or likes and just stuff like that, like it it, I don't like it. Like, it doesn't mean that their craft's not good. 
but it just, I want people that can't, I like working with people who really can't do anything else or um, they they have this thing where they just have to do it. And I think like a lot of the great artists, you know, it was like, well, I don't want to work at the, you know, do blue collar stuff at the mill. So I better try art right. or, so I just, I wonder if there's less of that now, like people are less screwed up. Well, I mean, I think people are probably less screwed up by and large. Um, I think living in the information age, the entry, like the entry point for being a musician is completely different. You can, you can make a record at home. You know, it's not going to sound like you recorded at Rumbo, but it's going to sound pretty good, you know? Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I mean, people understand the industry in different ways now because we live in the information age. There's just so much less mystery about how to do what you need to do. Um, right. Right. But the craft is still the craft. But to a but certain is degree, it still the craft? Because well, because now you're learning. Yeah, like that's the thing. Like now, but now you're learning. You're just like copying and pasting, and maybe. Right. I don't know. That's the thing. Like I, I just wonder if things have changed so much that. Right. What made playing like, guitar in a band cool? Or, I guess to a certain degree, that? the craft is is different even in like in pop music and hip hop music, which I love both of them. Uh, I think, you know, there's, there's not like a modulated chorus and a, and a breakdown and a modulated breakdown bridge in a lot of uh, modern music, you know, it's like songs are crafted in different ways. You know, it's all about. Yeah, I guess there's a, there doesn't need to be a rule. There is no rule. There's like it. ten hooks now, but no, no sing. You know, it's like ten sing song parts, but no bridge or whatever. You know, it's weird. Yeah, I mean, and then Kanye just said something about this week about I don't know if you saw this, but something about how guitar music with guitars in it is inherently worse than music I without think guitars. That it's an old, I think that's an old quote. I saw a meme like that and. I feel like a lot of those things get, I mean, he's said a lot of stupid things over the years. Um, um, you know, God, I watched the, you know, do you ever watch Letterman's thing that he, he did on Netflix? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's great. I love it. And I love that he came right out of the gate with Obama. It's so amazing. But yeah, I watched the episode with Kanye and I feel like I allowed myself to get duped or something. I mean, I guess I didn't, I didn't, it didn't make him more likable to me, but it, I became, I didn't like him more, but I felt like I respected him more or, or I just, I just was more accepting of who he is because he was so mm -hmm. open about his issues but now everything, like, now I feel like I'm an apologist for him because of, because he's open about his mental health. And then I'm like, what are you, are you kidding? You've come out publicly and, and said, look, I have mental health issues. I want to run for president. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know who I want to have be the president? Someone who, who d displays no cracks, you know, <laughs> someone who is human and, and, and has empathy and, and, and is emotional, but someone who is like solid, like, I don't want someone who's going to break down, you know? Yeah. But I think, I think it's all WWE oh, or sure. WWF. Yeah. Yeah. Of it's course. all, it's all, uh, Record politics has become like wrestling. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. I, it's so cliche now, but uh, people have been saying this for four years. It's like idiocracy. Have you mm. watched that movie? 
I've watched it. Yeah, I have watched it. Yeah, I guess that's where we're at. I just think I just (laughs) yeah, but you know what's this is uh, I think this is a weird thing where like people's political beliefs are like breaking up family ties and stuff. That's terrible, man. It's terrible. Yeah, I I just I feel like, and I catch some flack from friends, and I've been vocal about where I stand, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to allow relationships with people who I disagree with, even strongly. Um, I'm not going to let the outside world break those relationships down because um, that's a, that's like uh, being a card on the bottom of a house of cards. Like I'm not a card. I'm not a house of cards. Like I'm, I'm built of I'm not built a straw. I'm built a stone and I'm not, I'm not willing to be a part of the problem. I'm not willing to be, uh, wedged. Um, and I don't know when people give me shit about that. I, four years ago, I watched that documentary and I feel so stupid because I don't remember the name of it now, but this is, um, a black jazz musician in Washington, DC who Mm -hmm. befriends clan members and gets them to give him their robes and leave the clan. Hey guys, cut it out. I'm telling a serious story. Um, and, uh, and it, it really hit me because I just felt like, fuck man, if this guy, if this guy can can talk to these people who blindly hate him essentially and and still be kind to them to the to a point where the, they become friends and then they sort of renounce their membership in the clan like then why can't why can't I like exhibit that sort of kindness to someone like, I, like my experience in life is nowhere near that guy's experience. Like, I mm-hmm. haven't had to deal with anything like that ever in my life. Ever. You know? And so, yeah, I don't know. Have, um, do you think, like, I remember right when Trump got voted in, I, a manager for a band I work with said, um, and the manager had been around for a long time, just said, like, you know, this is going to be great for art there's going to be some really exciting art to come from this, but it's like, I don't know if exciting art came from the, the Trump presidency. It wasn't like Reagan in the eighties, right? It wasn't, there wasn't uh, like an explosion of, of punk rock. And I mean, a lot of the art that became huge in the eighties during Reaganomics was not American. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. You know, that we had like U2, The Police, um, The Smiths. Uh, who else do I love? Like Tears for Fears, Echo and the Bunnymen. I'm trying to think of, you know, you had all this stuff in the 80s in L.A., but there was nothing political about that. There was there was punk rock, like the second wave of punk, alternative tentacles and all that. But all that stuff started in the 70s. Yeah. Um, and what, Reagan was elected in 1980? Or took office in 1980? Is that right? Uh, I wasn't born, I think that's but right. I, think it was, <laughs> yeah. I think it was 80. Um, it was 80. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, well, what's crazy is that I feel like I'm, I have had the most productive and creative year of my life which is crazy this, since, since all this happened. Right. Cause it really lit a fire under me. Um, sure. Especially during the time when I was working the, my crazy hours, I became right. like insane and manic about being productive because for a few reasons, because I had such little time, 
that free. I was sleeping like four hours a night and then I had the weekend and I was just like defiant to, to allow that type of lifestyle to, to slow me down, you know, Mm -hmm. but also at a time when everyone's life is up in the air, you know, like people are afraid of getting sick and dying. People have lost their jobs or sitting around at home. You know, people are, I don't know. Like I, I just told myself, I am not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to fucking die and not like made me examine a lot of stuff. Like, I'm just not going to, I'm not afraid of dying, but I'm not going to die with a bunch of shit on the table. Like I want to get some shit done. And so it was the spark for that fire for sure. Yeah. I think, I think all of this is going to be good for art. I don't know if the past few years were, but, uh, right. um, but yeah, you're one, of, I mean, you're one of the artists I work with that. Um, I just love their drive. I mean, you just have this drive. You just get stuff done. It's so. pretty fun. I, you know, I kind of feel like I may have missed my calling. I feel like, I feel like there, like I have a second, I have a third wind maybe coming and I don't know exactly what it is. But when I first started doing this, here's a funny story. Okay. And I think I've told you this couch riffs like line six is responsible in some ways for couch riffs. Have I told you the story? No, I was working for a coffee company that got into some trouble and they had a big layoffs, a bunch of layoffs. I was one of those people because they were from California and I lived in New York. And so they were just like, sorry, we love you. And, and, you know, and I love them. They're old dear friends. And I, I buy coffee from them to this day. Um, even for the coffee that I produce here. And, uh, and I was just like, fuck, what am I going to do? And I applied for a few jobs and I was just like, ah, I did. I traveled around a little bit. I traveled to LA. I don't remember what I was doing. I was investigating, maybe trying to get some work. I went to Portland. I was, Oh, I was, I was looking at a record press like I went to Portland to talk to these folks who press records because I was thinking about buying a record press and trying mm-hmm. to give that a go. But it's very expensive, and I'm not an engineer, and that shit breaks down, so that's a terrible idea. Um, but Line 6 was hiring a, like a product specialist in mm-hmm. the Northeast. And I was like, perfect. I'm a shoe-in. I have experience. I can play. Uh, I love to talk to people. Maybe I'm not, you know, exactly. Maybe I'm not soup corporate material, but you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll, maybe they'll have me. And so I sent my resume in, and the the human resources uh, person was like, "Well, we love your resume. Why don't you make a video of you playing?" And they gave me like this list of songs. You know, there was of course like the all songs in the key of E. The song, basically the f- the five songs that you hear at Guitar Center, right? It's like sure, sure. Back in Black, some Megadeth song, some Metallica song. You know, like and whatever. And so, uh, I used my HX effects, and I I made a video. And I sent it in and I was like, I am going to be gainfully employed in a matter of days. And then I didn't hear anything from them. And I sure. was like, huh, okay. that's weird. And, um, you know, at this point I had been unemployed for like three or four months. And, you know, what I failed to recognize, which I think a lot of people are experiencing now is like, <clears throat> I wasn't very well groomed. I, and I went back and I watched the video like a month later. I was like, man, I, I, I felt like that was really good. I was like unshowered. I was in sweatpants. Okay. And, uh, yeah. uh, unshaven, unshowered in sweatpants and just like, you know, with like some, like a t-shirt with an upside down cross on it or something. And, uh, oh, I was sure. like, oh, I get it. 
<laughs> and so, oh. uh, but my wife, who is constantly surprising me with great suggestions, including the name for Couchrif, said, uh, you're kind of a pain in the ass right now because you have so much energy and nothing to do. Why don't you make some more videos? And so I did. And she's like, why don't you call it something? Why don't you just call it Couchress or something stupid like that and uh, start a channel and do it? And I was like, uh, okay. You know, and it gave me a project. And yeah, it's shit. Two years. No, I'm I'm impressed. I remember when this when this started, and and you told me about it, and I was. Well, it happened uh, because I was too lazy to actually take a shower, and make myself a presentable candidate to be a Line Six employee. <laughs> well, yeah, I get it, but uh, it's just interesting that um. But you do have this drive to. Do, I mean, you probably have done like a hundred shows or close to a hundred shows now, and you just um, almost a hundred podcasts. It didn't start yeah, as a I mean, podcast, of course. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's great. I mean, you're, you're sticking with it and you're doing it. I mean, just just starting something and keeping keeping going with it, something People don't really of itself do that. that's impressive. Well, I think that if you've been on tour and you've seen what a, what a like rock breaker job it is, you know? Mm-hmm. And you, I don't know, like, it seems pretty easy for me to stick with it. It's not easy to schedule, you know? Right. It just isn't. Um, if I had the resources, you know what I think? I think that if I had the resources of Dave Grohl, I would fucking okay. outproduce that guy. Like, I, th <laughs> and that seems like an unreasonable boast, I think. But if I had Dave okay. Grohl money, I would fucking do so much more than that guy because I love like I love following through on ridiculous ideas. Yeah, maybe that's that's something you have for sure. But if uh but if if I had a little money, the first thing I would do is I'd have someone schedule the podcast for me cuz I probably spend it as much time scheduling and doing post production shit as I do actually recording it. Do the fun part, as you said, I like the fun part. Yeah, I, like even like when you said post production, I think I'd I'd be as a I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't start my own podcast just because I'm. Uh, I don't know. Well, it's yeah, it's not the fun part. That's for sure. The man. the work involved keeps me it keeps me at bay. Or I, it's just the the intimidation factor seems big. Um, I guess I just play into my own narrative that I'm a behind the scenes type person, like not a, um, not someone that presents something of my own. You know what I mean? Like I'm a, I'm like the sixth man type thing. But how much do you love it when? And that's why I say like I can I can foresee a time when I produce couch riffs episodes or shows and i do not even perform in the videos it's just like all right here's a couch riffs video and it's five people of all different kinds of backgrounds uh playing you know fucking this hall and oats song or whatever i don't know yeah <laughs> who knows um i did have this i have all these funny ideas about artists like players that I want I really want to play particular songs I really want Slash to be in an episode at some point and I really 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 want him to play I Want a New Drug by Huey Lewis because go listen to that song and you can I think that you can imagine Slash playing that song yeah I'm gonna listen to, I mean right after we're done I'm gonna go back I mean but do you know Slash well enough to just hit him up for that no, but oh, okay. you know what? I, I, you know, I'm uh, persistent and uh, patient, relatively patient. And, uh, you know, I feel like if I am patient, persistent, and I continue to grow, 
I just feel like the sky's the fucking limit. Nothing's, I mean, there's no, as far as I see it, there's no reason that there, there's no reason I couldn't get Madonna on the show as, uh, someday. That's how yeah, that's the way to think about it. That's how I feel about it. I mean, that's how you have to feel. Like, nobody joined a band and they were like, well, uh, you know, we're only going to play Tuesdays at fucking the fucking corner dump. You know, that's it. Right. That's right, all right, I right. aspire to do. I, I mean, I was never that person. I never was like, all I want to do is just, you know, pick on this little acoustic on the porch all by my lonesome. Like I was never that guy. I was like, no, man, let's do this. That's it. Like, let's do the thing that got you all excited about it in the first place. The thing that, you know, let's do the MTV thing that you saw on TV yeah. when you were 12. Mm. So yeah, Madonna, if you're listening, I'd really love you to sing a Metallica song. How fucking dynamite would that be? Pretty amazing, right? What what Madonna? Yeah, I mean Madonna. Yeah, it's just amazing. What what song do you think she would be great at? Do you uh, you think like a early, like you know, like Kill 'Em All era, or do you think later on, like? No, 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 no. Later on, Um, something off Reload, something off Fuel. Nothing else matters. That would be pretty hot, man. That would be the really Unforgiven, hot, right? The Unforgiven is a great song, man. It is. What if? Um, do you know the Metallica guys? I've never really. I don't think I've met anyone from that I've, camp. I've met all of them, but oh, I don't, cool! But I don't know them. We did a tour in Australia with them. They're super nice guys. I'm good friends. Yeah, I've with, heard nice things. Um, Whit Crane sings in a band with Kirk and um, called the Wedding Band. Um, oh, cool! And they all worlds, small worlds collide. They just did that wah off thing with Mrs. Smith, who I play bass with. That's right. That's right. Did you ever connect with Mrs. Smith? Don't think so. Oh man, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Or did we? Or I think what might have happened is I think I'll have to go back. See, let me. I'm gonna make an email to myself. That's how I do these things. Um, I feel like the amp, the, those cool THR amps, were they they've been selling really well. So it's kind of hard to get. Um, mm-hmm. But then also, you know, when you work for a company and your job is to like give away free stuff. <laughs> That's a weird position to be in. So it's a good it's gig. hard to get a hold of. Yeah. Yeah. Except I, that I everyone wants away. everything all the time. That's true too. I wish I could give away more, but um It's just not the way of the world. Yeah, it's not the way of the world. But I love um whenever I can stoke someone with free gear, I'm happy to do so. But uh I think Mrs. Smith, I'm gonna make a note to myself because I feel like I I emailed um I emailed with Mrs. Smith, but I never, I think it was like we were out of amps or something was going on. So I got to make a note to follow up on that. How good does it feel being like, as you've said, being like a behind the scenes person, Mm -hmm. uh, when you get a piece of gear, a a guitar or, or like a THR or, you know what I have? I have that THR 100 Mm -hmm. and it's fucking awesome. I've, I gigged with it and it's great. I loved it. Um, and it's great because you can, you can do the two, yeah, whatever. I'm not, uh, you can do the two sounds and that cabinet is a stereo, stereo cabinet. Yeah. It's just like, it's like having two amps. It's, it's, like, yeah. it's genius. Um, I wish that it, that it, that thing caught more fire. And I feel like maybe, maybe users of the THR amp will, will upstream, you know, maybe, Maybe not. I don't know. But a really cool, like, forward-thinking product, that is. But how stoked are you when you get something to a player and they're like, yeah, uh, this thing's perfect, straight out of the box. It was great. I loved it. 
Um, it's a good feeling. And I've had, you know what? Um, I've had artists, I've gotten them gear and then they've like, oh, I wrote a song with this the second I got it. Or I used this on a record that I was uh, part of. Or right. produ- I work with like sometimes producers too. It just, that, it, that's what I love is just being able to assist um, with the creation. Cause I think, I just think maybe it's like my hippie thing in me of like, I really see as what I do is like a community service thing. Cause like music is so important to someone. So uh, you, you know it and I know it, how big, you know, following an artist was to who you are in a way. Oh, yeah. So I get to be part of that process for an artist. Um, so my thing is like, if I can give them a gear that inspires them to create songs or to maybe a guitar feels a certain way. So it brings something out of them. Um, that's a cool thing. Like that helps everyone. Um, so that's, so it, yeah, it's, a, it's a great joy of mine is when artists, when the products that the company I work for um, just nails something and the artist connects with it. Well, that's last a cool year thing. I got that, uh, I got that Yamaha acoustic. Yeah, they're great. And uh, it's inspired a number of songs that's, that's uh, going on, on my record. And I'm waiting on a couple of microphones right now so that I can, I can track it properly for uh, that record. I'm super stoked. Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, that's, that's probably, that's one of the nicest things about my job for sure. It's just, um, yeah, it just Yamaha makes really good stuff. I can't so, wait to send you a copy of my record, Scott. I can't wait to receive it because so many things are going to make much more clear sense. <laughs> when oh, okay you're gonna hear it and you're gonna uh you're gonna be surprised i'm excited not as how excited do, as i am um so how we've been on we've been on for like two hours now how yeah. do you know when an episode is done usually when my dogs start flipping out is when oh. we're done and I, Mr. Big is getting a little restless because, you know, uh, we, uh, it's like last walk. It's like between 9.30 and 10. It's it's like 9.35 now. So we'll, we'll probably start wrapping it up. Um, okay. What's uh, What does the rest of your year look like? I mean, do you, like, how, without getting into the politics of, of Yamaha, like, how, because people... I don't know. It's like the world is insane. Like, I don't know if I'll have a job in two months. Um, and, but, uh, but how do you, I mean, surely you guys are planning for next year. People are still launching product. People are still producing and, and you guys have your own factories. Right. We own our own Yamaha owns their own manufacturing facilities. Yeah. Um, So I think you just, in a lot of ways, it's such a big global company. I think you just keep, you keep going and you adjust. I mean, um, people are still, I think certain product segments, like I think, um, you know, Yamaha makes like really great studio monitors and like, I'm looking at two right now. Yeah. I mean, those are, um, sold out. I mean, there's things that Yamaha makes that have, have responded really well in terms of sales, I think, to the current environments of needing to stay home. And so for guitars, I'm trying to think, uh, I think a, re- a one or two releases got pushed back a few months, but nothing's really changed. And for me as artist relations, it kind of made this pivot from, um, it's kind of, you know, before my first, I guess you could say like five, five and a half years in the company, it was really like, it was the Smashing Pumpkins and again, it's me, Peter Hook and the Light, Butch Walker, um, you know, my uh, Reeves Gabrels, um, I work with and he's in The Cure and Reeves Gabrels and his imaginary friends. He lives so like I was working with like bigger artists. Or, oh, that's right. He lives by you. Yeah. I'm going to get, I'm going to get him. Great. I'm going to get him. Yeah, he's great. 
Yeah. Have you ever met him? No, but I've heard he's great. He he go he frequents a guitar store um, that I go to oh, to get my tech work done. Collar City Guitars. Right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I've been there. I've been there yeah. once. We did a we did we filmed something with him with Reeves once for the THR head. He also oh, loves right. that amp. Yeah, he Peter's did some great. Pure stuff with. Um, but the, for me, I guess what I'm saying is to make a, a long story short is that you know ultimately I think that is an aspect of our relations is these huge, like, you know, anchors of, of guitar. But right. I think, I think there's also things are just moving now so much to, to online and social media that it's kind of made me pivot in artist relations terms in a way that I was probably going to have to anyway. Whereas now I'm focusing on a lot of smaller influencers and people that do have stuff at home and, um, just create their own music, but just create their own worlds from their personal space. The um, Rev Star and I was, has done really well in ways that the SG never quite took off, it seems like to me. And that's just perhaps that's social media perception or. Um, yeah, I think it's social media, but also, you know, Japan, um, the SGs, or in the US, they're called SBGs, a solid right. body guitar. Um, you know, Yamaha is a very, just like once something, once something is out and it's done, that's it On to like the next cool project, right? which is, you know, a lot of brands in our industry, like they just live on their legacy. Whereas Yamaha is just very futuristic and like, well, we did SGs, like, why are we going to do these again? So, you know what I mean? Like, it's just always coming up with something fresh. So there's I think a bunch of sleeper Yamaha like things yeah. that never never caught fire and are like those soldano amps the yamaha soldano amp is rad yeah um it is there was a thing that rival that was like a like early generation modeler and effects processor uh magic style yeah that was great uh i don't know man they're just ahead of their time yeah. Um, and a lot of like, you know, they were doing the um, Troy Van Leeuwen and West Borland models. So cool. Um, yeah. I mean, there was, they're just ahead. Of, I mean, I would just say Yamaha is just a company that's just really loves innovating and, and they're not, uh, they're just not tied to, you know, it's frustrating for me because I'd love it if we had a line of like SPGs because I know artists want them. But, right. But you're also dealing with like what sales, subsidiaries wants and what dealers want to carry it right so i think revstar has been great and getting them to like people at, you know and not just getting them to like rock stars but just getting them to just people who are just great players and have their own thing in their own world has been helpful too it's funny like i'm sitting here at my chair as we're talking and this is like i'm looking at my yamaha monitors I have the HS fives. Mm-hmm. I wish I had held that, but I was living in a little apartment when I bought these things. So I wish I would have bought the eights, but I got the fives. And then I've got okay. in my guitar rack behind me, three Yamaha guitars. I got that Pacifica, which is great. And I used yeah. it in the spin doctors video. Uh, then I have my trusty, my black SBG, my SG 1820, which is like mm-hmm. one of my favorite guitars of all time. And then I got the Revstar. I mean, this is a six space guitar rack. There's I got yeah. I got three slots occupied by by Yamaha guitars. Well, that's also like part of uh my hustle too, is like <laughs> maybe it's not with you and me, we kind of work in a different way, but I try to the second I try, like I want artists to have so much Yamaha gear that it just becomes kind of part of their existence. But like that, that SG, it, that was, yeah. I've had that thing since 2012. And it's like, there are not a lot of guitars that st- like stick with, me. I think I've told you this, like my, when I decide, okay, this is a guitar that I'm not going to let go of. I'm going to keep this one. And, you know, there are certain, there are ways I have to trick myself into like, all right, how am I going to not fall out of love with this or if i do how am i going to make it too hard to let go of and so i sat in the necks on those guitars because it devalues them in a way that it would take 
a more specific buyer <laughs> to be interested in it, right? Oh, you sat in the neck. Well, I'm going to offer you 300 bucks less. And I'd be like, well, f- fuck you. This guitar is killer. I'm not going to take, I want $300 more. <laughs> Cause I, uh, cause I love it. Especially modified. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, two of these, I, yeah, think, I think I'm going to sat in the neck on the, on the, uh, Pacifica. I, I've really, really been, uh, enjoying to play it. Yeah. Pacifica are great. I mean, it's, it's great stuff. I mean, I didn't, you know, before I started working at Yamaha, I didn't really have a lot, a ton of exposure to the guitars or the instruments, like, and, um, and I got the job and, and just my last, you know, I do try to shout out people that have been helpful to my career for, even if no one's listening right now, <laughs> you know, I don't know how many people, I don't know how interesting I am to people, but, um, uh, Evan hey, Scott check it out. from Seymour Dunn. Yeah. Hey, but, but, I'm going to give away a hat right now. Okay. Listen, if you are still listening <laughs> two and a half listening. hours into this episode, I want you and the first person to comment, uh, uh, what was my first Yamaha guitar in, in the episode uh, post on Instagram? Well, I'm, I'll send you a hat. There. See, I told you. That's you how I do it. That's how I keep them. That's how I keep them around. <laughs> It's a big prize. I wear my couch riffs hat all the time. It's pretty good, right? So, thank you. no, they uh, honestly, they're my favorite hats. They fit better and they just feel better than most ball caps. It is kind of weird. So, trucker hat, classic trucker. It's a good prize. Um, I just was going to say, I just wanted to really thank Evan Scop. He played a big part in my career. He was at Seymour Duncan. He's the guy through whom he was the artist relations guy at Seymour Duncan that I kind of learned some stuff from. And he was the guy that worked with Slash and helped me meet Slash, which was like a, just a huge deal for me. Um, Evan he was recommended really good me, to me. Yeah, he recommended me to uh, Ken DePron at Yamaha when my job opened up, and and because of Evan, uh, you know, he put my name in personally to Ken, which helped me because I, I found out that um, the Yamaha HR like didn't want me to get an interview or something like however <laughs> whatever whatever that whatever that interview that first interview you're supposed to do with a company where they try to screen you like, right they try to screen me and they and but because of evan um he really did me a solid so oh, evan amazing. ken the prawn bob willicks and uh tom enrath i gotta thank for everything you know what i think that is uh a reflection of the kind of person you are that you would always that you would be sure to mention the people that have been good to you and i i appreciate that about you a lot oh yeah yeah well i thanks i, I just you. um oh shucks i appreciate you yeah i don't know um i don't know how i'm perceived you know what i mean like i'm so stuck in my head but i definitely always try to be um anytime you can be nice for someone i i just think that's a great thing so uh, it sounds very Mr. Rogers, but there's not a lot of people in life who will go out on, on a limb for you or give you a chance. Right. So a- anyone that does give you a chance, um, and then you, and then that chance works out, you should, I always just, um, I'm really big on just making sure that those people know that you, you have a positive impact on them. Yeah. I think that's good. I think that's good. Uh, but you know, the other thing is, um, one thing that my aunt told me when I was a kid and she still says it to this day is like, uh, you know what, what other people think of me is none of my business. <laughs> mm. And, uh, I love that. And I try to live exactly like that. Like, oh, well, oh, you don't like me. <laughs> well, like, I guess you have never met me then. <laughs> like, Interesting. Yeah. I guess I don't like uh i don't i mean it's not that i don't care if someone doesn't like me it's just like all right well what what the fuck do you want me to do about it you know yeah <laughs> like that's yeah. that's you so who cares mm. and if someone goes out of their way to to just like randomly tell you that they don't like you or they they're not into what you do like you have to wonder like are you doing yeah, okay? What's with them? 
are you all right? Yeah. Are you doing okay? <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. Things working out. Um, I'm going to walk these to eat dogs, dinner. man. I, yeah. I've never, I, I didn't think I'd, I need to eat dinner. I haven't eaten. I'm going to hang up. Yeah, I'm, I'm the guest and I'm saying I'm, oh, no, that's I'm okay. going to eat dinner. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. You know what? I, I love, like, I love talking to you. Like we, Oh, I've really? talked on the phone with you a lot and I love it. Oh, well, I, I love talking with you too. I just feel bad. Like, um, I just don't want to uh, waste anyone's time. Like, I don't know who's listening to this or who is going to listen to this. But the fucking uh, hat winner is who's listening. Hat winners. Listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but it's, you know, just, uh, potential like, hat you know, winners. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, Thanks for, I mean, I really appreciate you inviting me on. This is the first time I've ever been really interviewed like this or um, been on a podcast. So it's kind of cool and I, I really appreciate it. Oh, it's fun, man. Like this is like, this is what I do. And I think that, I think you have a very modest, you have a modesty to you that, uh, that, I, that I also appreciate. But you have a position that people... I think there are a lot of ways to be involved in music and you can be a musician and, and, and be involved with music all at the same time in so many different ways. And it was, I, it was late for me to realize all of that. And uh, I think that you have a, yeah. very cool, you have a very cool job and I think that people will be interested to hear about it and hear about uh, to bring it all the way back around to young people to hear about your career trajectory. <laughs> yeah, I would just say you can. I would just say whatever someone's passion is, just figure a way out. Like if you're not going to be the star, like so, anyone that loves basketball shouldn't just because you're not Michael Jordan, you can still get to have a career in basketball. You can probably, you know, work for a team. You can everything's possible. You just got to you know think about it. I had a buddy who was way in who there. was the juice guy for the Supersonics. See, he that's worked. A position. He was like he was in the locker room at uh, what rehearsals at practice and at games, making making juice for make for the players. And he has great stories. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you get to be part of it, and I, I just really encourage people to, um, you know, it, it's kind of it was my path, and you can you can get a job and whatever whatever that thing is in your life that you love more than anything, you can get, even if you're not, you know, the star or the center of attention, you can get you can have a very fulfilling experience um, working just in the environment, you know. Well, that's the thing about life is that you have an idea about what your life is going to be. And then life uh, shows you a bunch of different options and you, you know, you can choose to go down those roads or not, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of great roads you can, you know, there aren't just two roads that you can go by. Yeah. Yuck, 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 yuck. <laughs> uh, on that note. Uh, no stairway. You're right. On that note, you know, you're the best. You're the best. Thanks for talking with me. This was great. And I feel like I owe you a copay. Uh, <laughs> like this was a, and, uh, uh, we don't hopefully take I'll talk to you again soon. <laughs> uh, you, you can guarantee you're going to talk to me soon. <laughs> don't be yeah, silly. Okay. <laughs> it's perfect. It's I look forward to. All right, bud. Have a great night. All right. Have a great night. You too. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.